looks like we've got a number of people who are still joining, but good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone, depending on where you're dialing in from today. And welcome to Intel Inclusion Through Cultural Intelligence. Um, this is an important topic for many of us in the workplace today, because obviously creating an inclusive work environment is going to be very conducive to how well we're performing, how well we're pro producing, and also to just internal relationships. And uh, we'll be looking at it through a lens of how we can do that through developing cultural intelligence. So thank you all. Um, just by very quick introduction to myself, my name is Julia Gaspar Bates. I'm a consultant with TMA World based in Washington, DC, and uh, very happy to be here with all of you today. So I wanna just start by creating a context for this and, um, and to really think about, you know, we talk a lot, about, a lot about diversity, equity, and inclusion in the work environments. These are, are terms now that are becoming much more widespread in a global practice. But I wanna ask you to think about, you know, why is it so challenging for us to talk about diversity? And what I'd like to do is to have you just write in the chat box. Um, if you're not familiar with Zoom, you should be able to see um, a, a bar either at the top or the bottom of your screen. And if you pull down that and you click on more, you should be able to pull up the chat box and just write down um, why you think diversity is a very difficult topic for a lot of people to discuss at work. Okay, chat is disabled, sorry. Okay, so yes, please write it in the Q&A. So why is it difficult to talk about diversity? It's very personal, great, thank you, Sarah. Too much to talk about. Yes, it's a very big subject. It can mean different things in different countries. That's absolutely true. Most people don't think they have any control over the diversity in their workplace. So that might create a hesitation. Absolutely. It's a very sensitive matter. People are very afraid to ask uncomfortable questions or fear, or fear of offending others. Concern of creating an uncomfortable environment. Again, worried about offending others as well. People have varying views and some take it as a political stance. Because you don't think it's as the first thought when working with our colleagues, uh, you don't want to be considered offensive, absolutely matter. Um, collecting information is regulated, and that in some countries is absolutely true. Um, don't want to offend anyone due to sensitivity, lack of understanding. People are uncomfortable about what they might not know. Saying something wrong, working with people of different backgrounds is expected to be challenging. When talking about diversity, if you are a bit knowledgeable, you may say sensitive comments without realizing it. Your mindset and bias is pro proved to prevent enjoying diversity. Yeah, these are all really great examples. And, and absolutely, I think that it's so true that very often we don't talk about it because it's an uncomfortable topic, right? A lot of people are afraid of offending other people. It's opening that sort of can of worms, if you speak if you will, to, to a topic that might end up, you know, escalating to a different level. So that's one reason that people might event, prevent from talking about it. Another reason from a more personal perspective is some people might feel a sense of shame or embarrassment, um, you know, particularly if they are, are not being sensitive or around discussing what we call isms of sexism, um, homophobism, um, um, racism, things like that, that people might feel that there's a sense of denial or that they're being pointed the finger at. And it's also something that could be extremely personal for people, that they've been subjected to a lot of discrimination, for example, or a lot of pain that they have. And so having that conversation can really bring that up and trigger them emotionally. So these are all some of the ways in which diversity can be very challenging for us to discuss, particularly in the workplace, because we want to try to go along to get along and to really engage with our participants and our colleagues very well. So what I'd like to do now is to just pull up a poll very quickly and just to ask you to think about which of these um, topics and just choose one of them best describes inclusion in your perspective.
So it looks like about 80% of you have responded. We'll just give it a few more seconds. So everybody has a chance. So for those of you just joining, if you want to just respond to the poll on which of these best describes inclusion from your perspective. And we're almost there. I'll give it about another 20 seconds or so before I close the poll. Okay, so we've got about 90, 92 of you have responded. So let me just share the results here and hopefully you can all see that. So um, only see one person who said, making sure that you use politically correct language. Um, absolutely, you know, I think that while politically correct language is um, useful, it can sometimes also be damaging because it doesn't necessarily really um, deny the fact that there may be biases behind it or sentiments behind it, even if somebody is sharing something in that way. 26% of you said treating everybody the same. So that's also, you know, we, we have that sort of saying of um, treat others the way you would like to be treated as well, um, which is also, you know, a really noble and, and important one. And sometimes we refer to that as the golden rule. I usually like to tell people in my trainings to instead upgrade to what's called the platinum rule of treating others the way they want to be treated. And that's really kind of stepping outside of our own frame of reference and thinking about that maybe others don't want to be treated the same, right? That there may be differences that they have. They may have different um, ways of, of interacting and engaging with the world. So we talk about a lot about equality, equality being a sense of fairness, but I'm going to ask you to really instead reflect on equity. Equity. And equity is about really kind of looking at different perspectives of how somebody might want to be engaged with and treated. So it's not necessarily treating them the same, but it's so certainly treating them with respect from their perspectives. Um, making allowances for differences, absolutely really important. And that really requires us to, first of all, be willing to, to understand what those differences are and to really step back and to listen to people, to really hear their perspective, to understand their point of view, where they're coming from, to try to empathize and put ourselves in their shoes as well to have an understanding. And that really um, is important as we're talking about this topic of inclusion as well. And then helping those from underrepresented groups get ahead. Again, a very noble um, suggestion to do that. Um, the only challenge with that is that can create a disequilibrium, right? If we're helping others, particularly somebody who might be very sensitive to being already marginalized or underrepresented, not necessarily having their voice, um, helping them move forward could be perceived as also something as patronizing. So instead, I invite you to think about how can we become an ally? You know, what are those ways in which we can really engage with people to have a deeper sense of an understanding of why they're not willing to speak up at the table, of why they might not be participating to their full capacity, of why they might not be feeling included? So these are all just some questions to really think about as we go forward here, um, because we each have and are each called to think about how we can be more inclusive in our own actions, right? And, and what are those small micro behaviors that we can do on a day to day basis to make somebody feel included? So thanks, everybody, for uh, for sharing this. And uh, let's uh, let's move on here. So our definition definition of inclusion is the active valuing and the active respecting of all members of a group, incorporating different perspectives, 
values and attitudes. So really it's about looking at how we can not necessarily um, try to get people to assimilate to things that are already there and what they're doing, but really to hear them, to really engage and to really validate those differences as um, a way of optimizing our collaboration, as a way of really making something better. And that requires a lot of different things, um, which we'll talk about as well a little bit later. But what I wanna do now is just to ask you to, in the Q&A, just to write down, you know, what does inclusion feel like to you? And I really want to emphasize feel because so often we spend time in the workplace in our heads, right? Where we're thinking, where we're, we're, our work is requiring us to do that. But at the end of the day, when we're feeling, you know, going at home and we're speaking to our significant other or our friends about, you know, what happened, it's really those sentiments. That's what's really causing us to feel a part of something, to feel a sense of belonging, to feel that psychological safety so that we can step in and we can have our voice heard, we can speak up and share our ideas. So I'd love to hear from all of you, you know, just to write into the chat, into the Q&A, what does feeling, what does inclusion feel like to you? Feels like part of the team, being accepted for who I am, to not feel I'm indifferent or invisible, to feel comfortable to share my thoughts of how I feel. It feels like belonging. It's like you contributed and you were valued. Part of the team, belonging, feeling part of something, a team, a community, society. I feel seen and recognized. It feels like my voice and perspective matter, respected. My opinion matters, feeling safe, liberating, exposure and integration, peaceful. Being lis be listening carefully to others, being who I am and being accepted because of this. Excellent, Flavio. That my presence is visible, my contributions are valued, my needs are worthy to be heard and considered. These are all excellent examples. Being part of something bigger, authentic, being myself, bringing my whole self to work, absolutely. Accepted for who I am, not feeling invisible, on a team, free to get what I want and need without worrying about what others think, being noticed, recognized, validated, and valued. Fantastic responses. So I want you to just pause for just a moment, maybe even close your eyes if you feel comfortable doing for so, and just notice what's happening in your body when you're thinking about being included. You know, what are those feelings? Maybe you're feeling like, ah, oh, your breath is nice and deep and easy. You feel a sense of peacefulness, a sense of relaxed, a sense of, oh, I can just let down my guard. And what I'm gonna ask you to do is to flip that. And to think about for a moment and just to feel, and if you'd like to share in the chat box, please go right ahead and do so. But what does it feel like to be excluded? And as you're perhaps writing that in, if you want to share, or if you are just beginning to feel that sensation, just notice how that might be shifting in your body. Maybe your breath is starting to, to go a little bit faster. Maybe your muscles are tightening. Maybe your energy is changing. So we oftentimes feel a very different sensation, right? When we're included and when we're excluded. And I really wanted you to think about this from both perspectives here, because all of us in certain situations in our lives might feel excluded and feel included, which is why when we recognize what exclusion feels like and how it feels in our bodies, it's really critical for us to notice, you know, what can we be doing to help others feel that sense of inclusion. You know, what are those things that have made us, as you were writing them in the Q&A before, what are those things that made you feel included? You know, what were those behaviors that people did in the workplace that your manager or your colleagues did? Perhaps it was when you first arrived and you were onboarding and somebody kind of took you by the hand and said, hey, let me show you around, or let me tell you a little bit about some of the acronyms that might be really confusing or orient you and introduce you to other people. Um, or perhaps you didn't receive that. And you know, what was that sensation there? So again, just recognizing how this might have an impact on us because exclusion usually is much more detrimental, right? Um, it's about not feeling that sense of being part. It's about not belonging. It's about not feeling that sense of safety. And there's both a moral and an ethical um, kind of a, a response to this as well. I mean, first and foremost, it's discrimination. Um, it's extremely damaging, not only to our mental well-being, but also to our physical well-being. I mean, there's uh, research that shows that people who are excluded and don't feel that they belong get sick more regularly as well. And also in many contexts, it's illegal. And in, in many um, countries and, and companies, it can be illegal as well. From a more practical standpoint, um, 
it's really detrimental to um, to our teamwork, right? I mean, team collaboration, if somebody doesn't feel that sense of inclusion, they're not going to be feeling part of it. They're not going to be putting themselves out there much more. Um, that's going to ultimately uh, oftentimes lead to attrition and to turnover. And just want to invite you to just think for a moment yourself. Has there ever been a time that you've left a job because you didn't feel that you belonged, that you didn't feel that you were included in some ways? And to Flip that and to think about yourself, you know, as perhaps a manager or as a team member, how does that impact you if somebody leaves because they don't feel included? You know, how is that going to impact your own sense of morale? Um, in terms of work, the work doesn't go away. So it just has to be redistributed to other people. And from a manager perspective, it can be a real headache because not only do you have to take the time and recruit somebody and hire somebody and onboard somebody, but you may have also lost some real talent and it could also be damaging to the reputation of the team or to the company as well. Um, it certainly restricts our talent pool. And then it's also really demoralizing. It causes a sense of disengagement. It increases conflict among people as well. So these are some really important factors to think about in terms of how important inclusion is in the workplace and why we really see this as a topic that's so critical to be discussing. So let's talk a little bit more about, and I saw a number of you had talked about authenticity in your um, in the Q&A before, which is so important to inclusion, right? I mean, think about those times where we feel that we have to wear masks and we have to try to be somebody that's different from who we are just in order to fit in. And how freeing, how liberating it is, as some of you already mentioned, when we're able to take off those masks and really be ourselves, to bring our full selves into the work environment and that safety that we feel when we do that. Oftentimes, what we also find is that a lot of companies and organizations around diversity, equity, and inclusion do sort of what we call performative inclusion, right? Which is really about checking the box. It's maybe um, saying, using the right words or, you know, having a marketing campaign to boost the brand, but it's really not changing what the internal culture is. So it's great to have those words, but if you're not changing the culture and that still is having an impact, it's really not doing much good. And in fact, it's doing much more damage. So really want to invite you to think about this. Um, there's a really good book by uh, Rennie uh, Eno Lodge called Why I No Longer I'm Talking to White People About Race. And this is an interesting topic, too, because I've heard this very often in some of my own workshops and with clients, when people who have been marginalized or have, you know, been unrepresented end up becoming tokens and people will say to them, you know, well, tell me about this. What do I need to do or what should I do better? And I hear so often it's not my responsibility to be educating you. It's your responsibility to take charge and to educate yourself around this. And I think that that's really important and really the topic of the book as well, because you know, being in, being able to come into that space and not be, you know, put into the spot, for example, um, which can be very uncomfortable for some people, but being able to be authentic to talk about these topics and to really discuss them. So how do we go about doing this? And this is really where cultural intelligence comes in. Now, many of you have probably heard of and are familiar with them, perhaps practice as well, emotional intelligence, which is really about creating that sense of empathy, learning different perspectives, active listening. And what we'd like to invite you to do is to think of ways that you can ramp this up in your work, um, in your own practice, in your own skills, by really thinking about it from different cultural perspectives. You know, what are those ways in which we can um, step into that space and to really put into practice some of this on a day-to-day -day basis. So the first one I want to talk about is attitude. Um, you know, what is that sense of curiosity, of that humility, of that openness to difference that we actively seek out, that flexibility that we may have that's really inherent to how we are, that tolerance that we may have as well. The second stage is the awareness. And this is really about self-awareness. It's about really being able to, um, to explore and to think about, you know, what are my cultural preferences? How do I communicate? What is my personal style of communication? How do I like to build relationships? Do I want to spend time really kind of cultivating that deeply, really getting to know my colleagues beforehand or my clients beforehand on a personal level before we engage in work, or is it different? It's how we view time. It's how we really look at a lot of these different concepts of how we work on a day-to-day -day basis, making decisions and whatnot. 
It's also having an awareness of what some of our biases and those stereotypes are that we may hold and how that may show up as well. So really when we elevate our awareness, it's so critical to think about that, particularly when we're working in global contexts or when we're working across diversity. The third step is to really think about the knowledge. You know, what do I, what can I do to learn about others? What are their values and beliefs? You know, how can I understand and perhaps try to put myself in their shoes to understand what their worldview is and how they might see the same issue very differently than I do? And what can I do to be able to find ways to reconcile that as well? And then the last one is the skills. And this is the one that we really want to encourage you to think about a little bit more. You know, how do we develop those skills to really enable us to engage, to be able to step into that space and to put into practice across all senses of diversity, not just um, across, you know, certain ones, but across diversity of, of cultural diversity, linguistic diversity, age diversity, um, gender diversity, race or ethnicity diversity, sexual orientation diversity. How can we apply all of this in these different contexts? So let's look at this and what the CQ, um, the cultural intelligence skills are. The first one is curiosity. And curiosity is to really pause and to ask yourself, how well do I really know my colleagues? You know, do I really know how they think, how they act, you know, how they, what they, what their worldview is, you know, what their life is, you know, what am I doing to try to get to know them better on a personal level and to ask those questions and show that curiosity. And particularly around somebody who might not necessarily feel that they have their voice heard in all situations. So I think that this is a really important starting point for us to be able to open that space, to really recognize that differences are there and what can we do to learn more about each other. The second one is the courage. And courage is really about being willing to, first of all, admit when we've made a mistake, when we've done something wrong, perhaps, or something offensive to somebody else. It's also about stepping into that space to intervene on behalf of others, to be a change agent, for example, when something happens and somebody is um, you know, discriminated against or you're observing or experiencing something and to really be able to do that. And it's also about validating somebody else, their worldview and their experience. It's about making ourselves vulnerable in certain situations to share what our own shortcomings are or how we might not know have known something. So these are some of the ways, and particularly I, I find that this is so important for leaders to be modeling this in the workplace, because when you're modeling this for others, then there's much more of a likelihood that others will be willing to do so as well. The third one is the cognizance. And this is again, kind of coming back to, you know, what are my biases? What are those stereotypes that I hold? Um, First and foremost, I think it's important to mention that we all have biases, that there's not one person who doesn't. And while some of them we might be conscious of, most of them we're unconscious of, right? And those unconscious biases that we have oftentimes leak um, sort of attitudes and behaviors that we might have towards other through some of our, our micro behaviors, um, oftentimes microaggressions in particular. So having that awareness of our biases and then being willing to step back and say, ooh, I recognize this, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm behaving in this way. Where does this come from? Why am I considering this about, why do I think this about this individual in certain ways? What sort of messages have I received from society, from family, from my education about who this other person is? And then kind of coming back and saying, what can I learn about it as well? How can I stop that bias? Maybe I can ask questions and show more curiosity, but challenging what those biases may be and challenging those assumptions that we may have towards others. The fourth one is collaboration. And this is really about um, looking for ways that we can really include people actively. So as I mentioned before, it might be, you know, stepping in with somebody's new in the workplace and saying, hey, can, can I invite you to lunch? Let me get to know you and learn a little bit more about you, particularly somebody who might be different from you, somebody who might have a different style, have a different culture, have a different gender or a different age or whatever it may be to really look for ways to actively include other people. And then the last one is, what is that commitment that we're making? 
that commitment to really to be an ally or to be an advocate for others. Um, you know, some very small examples of this um, that I hear from some of my clients, you know, oftentimes um, I hear that uh, people say that in, in a meeting, a woman might say something at the table or come up with an idea and um, her comment is ignored. And then a male colleague might um, say the same thing afterwards and people say, hey, that's a really great idea. So noticing when something like that might happen and making that commitment to afterwards say, hmm, that's a really fantastic point that Mike made. And I just want to point out that Karen made that point earlier as well. And um, that's really great that she was reinforced. So we can find ways of being change agents as well when we make that commitment to stepping into that space and to breaking down those feelings that people may have of exclusion and, and to make them feel more inclusive and that they're part of something. So what I'd like to do now is to hear from you, you know, to write in, in the Q&A again, you know, what are some of the things that you can do to demonstrate or some of those things that you're currently doing to demonstrate any one of these five skills? And please feel free to write them in. How are these skills showing up for you at work? Excellent. So learning a few words of their language, that's a fantastic way, you know, um, again, for those of you on the call who might be native English speakers, you know, even just being cognizant of the fact that English is the international language that's spoken. And if you're a native English speaker, you know, that you have a certain amount of power that others may not necessarily have. So making that effort is a really great way. So please keep those coming as well. It's important that leaders stand up and speak out. Absolutely, that's so critical. Asking questions from colleagues, that's a great point. You know, if you're finding that somebody is not necessarily speaking up in meetings, asking them, you know, what do you think about this? You know, what is, what is your thought process? And if they might be uncomfortable doing it in, in a group setting, you know, asking them afterwards, it's allowing them to get their voices heard. Try to practice curiosity to learn about others and their backgrounds. You know, I have some clients um, as ice breaking activities that they sometimes do or team building activities. They actually have, you know, especially with global teams that they're working on, they may have somebody come in and just, you know, do a presentation, you know, a team member doing a presentation on some aspects of their culture. And that's a really great way of learning, of letting people showcase whatever their culture may be, whether it's a national culture or it's an ethnic culture or racial culture or whatever that may be gender, something that really allows people to, to teach others about that. Researching the local culture, absolutely doing your cultural due diligence, right? I mean, learning about that yourself and not expecting others to teach you, but actively going out and soliciting that. Um, having patience, allowing space and time for people to get their thoughts out. You know, that's a really important one. And I think especially for people who are um, not native English speakers, and especially in this, you know, virtual context in which we've all been working for the past two and a half years, is recognizing that allowing that space and that pause sometimes allows people to speak up more and particularly encouraging others and say, you know, would love to hear those voices that, nece that haven't necessarily spoken yet. Um, would love to hear different uh, perspectives and different opinions. So inviting that dissent and that different voice in as well can empower people to perhaps feel more comfortable. Learning sign language, excellent. Ensuring that everyone in a meeting room participates in some way, whether that's by speaking or in chat or even sharing an emoji. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's a really great way, especially when you're in a large group. You're going to have introverts. You're going to have people who might not be willing to speak up because of linguistic differences or because they don't necessarily feel safe or they don't know people. So inviting people or setting that expectation allows everybody to be able to participate at a certain point if they want to. Um, ensuring that closed captions and alternative text are used. Absolutely. That's so important for people who might have, you know, hearing challenges. Participating in groups where you can learn more, part of an ally group, and also being open to new info and cultural learning. Fantastic. Would it be considered awkward or even a microaggression to always ask people about their culture? You know, that's a really great question. Um, I think not if you set it up in the sense. I mean, just saying, you know, I really don't know about 
you know, your culture at all. And I would love to know more. And do you have any books that you could recommend that I can learn more about it? Or is there anything that you'd be willing to share with me? That shows a curiosity and it shows an interest. I think that you don't want to put people on the spot if they feel uncomfortable. So it really depends on how you're setting it up. But if you're doing it out of a sense of humility, and I think that that's where it's really important and also genuine interest and genuine concern and a sense of empathy. That's a great way of building connection. But you have to also read, you know, where you're at with the person as well. Um, inviting others to, to the table simply for lunch, but also to make the decision at the table. You know, an absolutely great example of that, right? Who are those people who are always making the decisions and whose voice isn't heard and what's being lost as a result of that? We find that people who don't feel a sense of belonging and don't feel included oftentimes are hesitant to speak up. And as a result, there may be voices that really great ideas that you hear that are not shared. Um, I want to give an example of this recently in a work workshop that I was delivering where a woman said that she had left her previous company after only a few months because she had these she came in and she saw some inefficiencies that were taking place and she felt like I can really help them because we were doing things differently and nobody wanted to listen to her and so she ended up feeling that sense of frustration and ended up resigning a few months later pronouncing someone's name properly yeah and we're going to talk about that in just a moment in a case study as well that we're going to to do. Um, establishing ways of working cards so people understand how you prefer to communicate, receive feedback, etc. You know, this is really important because the way we communicate, you know, we all think about effective communication. And some of us might be very direct and very explicit in terms of how we communicate, you know, clarity, short messaging and whatnot. Others might be much more indirect and much more implicit and really want to sort of read between the lines and not offend somebody by coming out too strong. And we have mutual perceptions about that as well of what's effective and not. And so having that deeper sense of understanding, and for those of you familiar with Country Navigator, um, you learn some of that also in the tool, um, but really having that sense of understanding is um, allowing you to think about how you're going to go forward. And that's really where that cognizance can come in as well and how you can really enhance the collaboration. So a really great example of that, particularly around feedback, right? Because feedback is a gift, but it's also important to recognize ways in which feedback can and should be given. Um, being patient, listening and understanding our background and culture. Absolutely. You know, I can't say how important it is to actively listen. Um, we all spend time multitasking in certain situations, but even something like that can be a microaggression, right? For somebody who's typically being marginalized or is being unrepresented or discriminated against, you know, multitasking and not really listening them to them might be perceived in a very different way as you intended it. So there's always that gap between the intent and the impact of how something is interpreted, right? Um, checking if the physical space is inclusive prior to events, meetings, et cetera. Absolutely. You know, we oftentimes forget people with disabilities, right? And what there might be some challenges. I was just recently um, delivering a workshop um, here in Washington for um, the International Visitors Leadership Program, which is a State Department run program on global diversity, equity, inclusion. And my co-facilitator actually has muscular sclerosis and was in, is in a wheelchair. And the building that it was in is a very old building and did not have wheelchair accessible status. And it was really wonderful because you know, they went out of their way to be able to go and get a ramp and make sure that it was accessible for her to get in and to really go out, you know, to look for all of that. But that's not always the case. In certain room setups, it's important to even think about the meeting room and how that is. And just going that extra step can go a huge long way for somebody. Um, I also want to, you know, encourage people to think about that with um, ableism and, and disabilities, we also have many that are invisible, right? And that extra pressure that people that puts on somebody who might be, for example, um, have a, a speaking disability or perhaps be on the spectrum and all of that. So really being patient and looking for ways to really um, help that person as well and to really recognize um, that person is, is a huge way of making somebody feel included.
Speaking slower than normal is part of the audience if not fluent in English. Yes, thank you so much, Ricardo. I always have to remind myself of that as well. I do a lot of work with teams that are very global. And so recognizing that even how expressions that we use sometimes might not be known by other people. So being very mindful of idiomatic expressions or, or culturally relevant expressions. And if they're being used, saying to somebody, hey, this is what this means. Um, I know I work with a lot of clients as well where acronyms are used. And you know, not everybody understands acronyms when they're first coming in, particularly for a new employee. So even taking that time to explain what an acronym is to somebody can really be useful as well. So these are all really great examples. Thank you so much for sharing. And you know, want to encourage you to also think about how you can continue you know, to practice these different skills as well. Um, as you go forward in your work to really bring that practice of cultural intelligence into your day-to-day -day work to really foster that sense of inclusion. So let's talk for a moment about um, agency. And I think that this is a really important topic as well, because um, for those of you not familiar with what the term means, it's really about having a sense of control or power um, to be able to have choices, to make certain decisions. Um, typically, people who do not feel included, who feel excluded, don't always feel like they have agency. They don't always feel like that they have the power to perhaps set the norms or the behaviors or certain protocols within the team or within the organization, that they might feel that they're more of a burden or their voice is not heard. So really trying to create that sense of agency is really important. But it's also important to think about that even some Sometimes when we're trying and we have the good intentions to be inclusive, how that might also take away from somebody's sense of agency. And I'm going to give a personal example of this uh, myself and then also one of things that I've heard from, um, from, from clients as well. Um, many years ago, I, I spent the beginning of a few years of my career working in Paris, um, France, and it's very typical um, in many work environments to go to lunch with your colleagues. And I was working for one company there where that was sort of the expectation and the manager really wanted to use that. It was a small company that we would always eat together every day. And while the intention was really wonderful and I really appreciated it, I also felt that it was kind of enforcing me to um, engage in a certain way that I didn't want to. For me, going to lunch and going sitting outside in nature and on a park bench and reading my book was really what I wanted to do. So that was a way I felt a little bit forced um, and didn't necessarily feel that I had the power to speak up and to do something very different, even though the intention was very good. Another example that I've heard a number of times from clients is that sometimes for team building activities, um, you know, the team will go out for a happy hour after work, you know, go to the local pub or to the bar or whatnot. And that sometimes that sort of as an expectation, you know, for people to do that. And it might really feel like non-inclusive behavior for somebody who can't go for various reasons. You know, they may have, you know, children and they need to run home for their family matters and to pick up children from daycare. Um, it might be because for religious reasons, they don't drink any alcohol and being in a place where there's alcohol served or a lot of people are drinking is very uncomfortable. And it might be also because they have a drinking problem. So really putting themselves in that situation. So this is where, when we really have an understanding of who our colleagues are and what it is, we can try to find ways of engaging, even in things that we think are, we're doing that is inclusive, that is really fitting for everybody. And that might not unintentionally be excluding somebody for various reasons. So what I'd like to do now is just to show you, um, and I'll read this as well. This is actually a real um, example of something that happened um, to one of our participants. Um, so Lee Wan has just handed his notice in. He's a gifted technical designer, but only lasted five months with the company. In his exit view, it was clear he couldn't wait to be gone. He said that no one ever listened to his ideas. He knew that his English was accented and he made a lot of mistakes, but people either talked over him or they finished his sentences for him and they got the credit for his ideas. So somewhat similar to what I shared. He often worked late as he had to work in, with the US office quite a lot, but no one ever invited him to go for drinks after work and didn't really feel that anyone respected him as a professional. His boss was much older than him and just didn't believe he could have a credible contribution in a field that was new to Lee Wan. 
To make matters worse, everyone insisted on calling him Lee rather than Juan, although he told them his name several times. So again, some of this might resonate for some of you, right? We see a lot of different things that are going on here from perhaps ageism to perhaps, you know, um, differences because of accent or, or nationality. Um, and want to ask you to perhaps just write into the Q&A, you know, what would you do? What would you suggest or what would you have done to perhaps avoided Lee Wan's resignation? Please just write that in the Q&A. Okay, so listen, provide a project that he could own behind an idea that he had, even if a relatively small one. Yeah, absolutely. So really giving him ownership, giving him agency there as an advocate, act as an advocate for him during meetings. Absolutely, Lydia. So again, invite you to think about what would that look like to be as an advocate? You know, would be actively saying, hey, Lee Wan is new and he has some really great ideas or let's hear his fresh perspective, you know, and bringing him in that way. Sharing recognition and appreciation with him at various points, checking in on him. You know, those small ways of really um, validating somebody, you know, and, and I want to share this because, you know, we sometimes talk about losing face and, and giving face, um, which can cause shame or embarrassment to somebody. And in some cultures, singling somebody out, even in a public setting, could cause a sense of loss of face or embarrassment, particularly if they tend to be more collectivistic or group oriented. But really soliciting saying, hey, you know, Lee Wan, I really saw that you, you know, you've been working really late. And, and I know that this is, you know, a hard project. And is there anything I else I can do to help support you, you know, that, that you're, you're really putting in that extra time can go such a huge long way. A small appreciation or thanks can go a long way to helping people get to know him on a personal level to understand his interest and skills. Absolutely. And, you know, that's important to think about too, because how do we get to know people? How do we build that relationship, right? For some people, even if the intention is showing curiosity, asking personal questions might feel uncomfortable for them. So there's sort of a give and take, and we have to sort of recognize that, but perhaps finding points in common or throwing a subject out and seeing if they can engage in a certain way. Creating space for him to share his ideas, absolutely. As a manager, call on him by name in meetings to give voice. Yes, that's a great example too. Um, the only hesitation that I'd have for that is that, um, again, some people don't want to be put on the spot. So maybe, you know, one way of doing that is saying before the meeting, hey, I'd really like you to, to speak up and to share something on the meeting. Are you able to do that? Are you willing to do that? So really kind of empowering them so that they're not caught off guard um, and feel really awkward or uncomfortable about it. So I think it's um, a great way to find ways of engaging people. And at the same time, particularly if the person's introverted or if the person doesn't necessarily have the answer, calling on them in setting can also, um, you know, be, be somewhat damaging. And particularly, you know, if it's sort of a sense of a tokenism. Well, let's ask in this case, our, our one Asian person sitting in the room, what he thinks or she thinks or they think. Correct name usage, ask him for his inputs and ideas. You know, so important in so many cultures, names really matter, right? I mean, they're chosen very intentionally. They have a sense of meaning. It's really a part of the, one's identity. And so, and I see this so often with work that I do with so many people, it's, it's difficult for sometimes for us to pronounce names, but asking people, you know, I oftentimes will say, oh, I pronounce it. Is that how it's pronounced? Or please correct me if I'm wrong. And what does your name mean? That's a really interesting name. That's a curiosity. It's usually a safe topic, but it's really showing that you care and that you really want to listen to somebody. So a really great idea. 
reach out to him to get feedback. Absolutely. That's a great way. And especially really talking to somebody if they're leaving, you know, having that understanding, you know, what did we do? We feel like, you know, we should, we could have done something better. Is there anything we can do to retain you? And, and we don't want to repeat our mistakes a second time, right? So actively soliciting feedback is really a gift, even if it's uncomfortable, even if we don't necessarily, um, you know, want to hear it and, and, and it might make us feel um, out of our comfort zone. Um, it's important because it allows us to learn and to grow from and how to move forward and to do something differently in the next time. As an HR business partner, I would set touch points to check on his onboarding. Great. Absolutely. Create an opportunity to socialize. So important. You know, I see that so often with teams right now, especially in this virtual context, you know, how can you create more sort of social activities where you can have breakout rooms or things like that? Or if you're in a hybrid and an office environment, being very mindful also of making sure that those people are inclusive. And I think that that's a very important thing to talk about as well, as so many companies and organizations are moving back into this hybrid workforce, ensuring that those people who might still be virtual in a meeting are included. And that's a, a work in progress that I'm still seeing with many clients right now. Um, providing a partner or a mentor as a new hire. Excellent example, you know, so important for people to feel that there's a buddy and even somebody, you know, preferably who even comes from a similar sort of background or from a previous type of organization. I know that some companies will do this if they are acquiring smaller companies, they might bring somebody in to partner and to mentor as sort of a buddy, somebody who's onboarding, who comes from a similar type of background because they can really help them in that way. Um, acknowledge his contributions, assign the mentor again, great. Recognize he was missing from events and not included, inviting him and potentially brought it up to his boss too, that he needs to be included to give help give me team experience we all know and enjoy. Absolutely, you know, I mean, that's really important. If you see that somebody is not participating in team events or activities, even if they're invited, asking why, why is that question? What is it saying? Is this person, we might not recognize, we might think that we're being inclusive in our behaviors, but people might not feel that themselves. So really having a deeper understanding of what their subjective experience is and how that might be impacting them. Matching with a buddy again would bring him into the team and allow him to dictate the involvement in social activities more easily, create time to understand him and listen more to him, absolutely. You know, again, that space, right, of actively listening and just thinking about somebody, particularly somebody who might be underrepresented or somebody might be marginalized, you know, actively asking them to share their voice is giving them agency, is giving them that opportunity. Instead of completing his sentences, people, organization could help him practice the language and understand his ideas. Absolutely. And creating an on, special onboarding for people from other cultures and give them the extra tools to put in practice for this integration. Yes. So these are all really great examples. Thank you so much for, for sharing that. And just encourage you again, you know, we can't change others. We can only change ourselves in these situations. And so what are those things that you can do in every single day interactions? with your colleagues, with your managers, with your clients, with whoever it is that you're working with to really foster that sense of inclusion. So as we wrap up and we'll have just a few minutes also for Q&A for those of you who have it, but I just want to remind you to keep practicing. You know, for some of you, this might be just a, a reinforcement of things that you're already doing and that you already know, but to think about, you know, how are those things that you can do to really cultivate or to enhance your own level of cultural intelligence? What additional things can you do to really foster um, a more positive attitude and really show that sense of humility and curiosity and whatnot? How can you deepen your self-awareness and your knowledge about others um, recognizing what are those values and beliefs that both you and your colleagues might hold and how might they be different and what can you do to perhaps close those gaps and then more importantly starting to put into practice those skills you know we've got some great examples that you've given in the chat box as well today about curiosity you know really finding ways and want to invite each of you to perhaps even just write down um, and if you'd like to share also in the Q&A, what are some takeaways that you have from this session? You know, what are some things that you are going to put into practice that you're doing differently based on what you've learned today? Um, what are one of some of those skills that you're going to start to apply today or tomorrow in your job to try to make others feel more included? 
So I um, want to welcome any other questions um, that anybody has. And also, if people would like to share that in the chat box, in the Q&A box, please feel free to share what some actions that you might be taking will be. platinum rule excellent yeah and you know Cyril that's such an important one because I think again our intention of treating others the way we want to be treated is really great but others might not want to be treated in the same way right and so that really shows that we're actively looking for a way to engage them there were so many good suggestions will a recording be sent out um, I'm not sure about that I'm going to ask my colleagues um, from TMA world to be able to answer that one um, the platinum rule again okay not making assumptions about my colleagues taking more actions to really get to know them fantastic great be aware of my conscious and unconscious biases wonderful yeah and please feel free to put any questions that you have in there as well and i'll be happy to answer them Okay, so um, for those of you who would like to stay for questions, um, please feel free to, but I hope that this has been very helpful for you today. Um, a couple of things that I just want to point out before you log off. Um, first and foremost, um, for those of you who already have a culture, Country Navigator account, please feel free to go in. There's a lot of information in here that's reinforcing what I've talked about today that can really complement that. For those of you who are new and do not have one, you will soon be receiving an email from Country Navigator with logon information for you so that you can explore the platform. Um, also, as you close this, you're going to have a link for a survey and would like to just ask you to just take one or two minutes if you could fill that out so that we have a better understanding of what worked well in this masterclass or what you would have liked to see more of. So for those of you who are getting off, thank you so much for your active participation. I hope that this was helpful. Hope to see you again. And again, I can stay on for a few more minutes as well for those of you who may have any questions. Thank you all, glad this was helpful. Okay, I see a question here. How can you gain buy-in from leadership that doesn't understand inclusion? Any suggestions? Hmm, <laughs> that is a very difficult one. And I'll, I'll also invite my colleagues to, to share any perspectives that they have. Um, I would say that it's really, um, you know, first of all, sp perhaps stating the business case for it, you know, in terms of, you know, how it's going to impact the ROI, maybe some of the things that I shared today, because that's where they're perhaps going to look at, um, you know, how it might be impacting, you know, if you're able to get any statistics on the attrition, you know, on how many people are leaving, or if you're able to get any data from HR 
on why people might be, you know, leaving the company or productivity might be down, anything like that, because that tends to, especially with senior leadership, that tends to um, really speak for them. Um, so that would be the first step. Secondly, hearing stories, you know, if you have that sense of other people, you know, stories are a really powerful way and getting people to share some of those so that you have some real concrete case studies that you can present to people in terms of why this is important. But I think really relating it to the business case, because people who don't necessarily see the value and the importance of it and are only seeing the bottom line, this has an impact on the bottom line. So if you can connect it in that way for people, um, then that might be more uh, easily easier for them to understand that. So any other questions, please feel free to put them in the chat box. See, we still have a number of people on. Okay, I see another question. Is there a difference in how to approach inclusion from the perspective of the people who have suffered exclusion? What I mean is, is if I've been excluded, how can I become included? Hmm, that's, excuse me, a really great question. And I think that, um, you know, there's so many different ways to look at that and to answer that. Um, I mean, first and foremost, I think, it, you know, to ask yourself, what are the ways in which you felt excluded? Has it been pushed out? Has it been, do you think it's intentional? Do you think it's unintentional? So there are lots of different questions. And then I would think about, you know, if it's because perhaps you're new to the team, or perhaps you're a younger member of the team, and um, you're not invited to some of these meetings, and you've got some really good ideas, you know, see if you can identify maybe a couple of different people. Um, I also think that, again, kind of the courage piece, if we're looking at the skills, is sharing that with people and saying, you know, um, again, saying, I know that this was perhaps not your intention and, and we want to assume positive intent, but I just want to share with you how this makes me feel. And, you know, people are much more receptive to feedback if it's um, a situation where they're not being, the finger isn't being pointed at them and they're being blamed or shamed in some way that puts them on the defense. But if you come in with that sense of humility and you say, you know, I've been feeling this. Now, I also recognize that that can be really challenging, particularly if you are, you know, have kind of historically, if it's compounded because you've been excluded in, in many other situations within this team or this organization. But I think that it's looking at some small ways, some small windows that you can try to get in there and trying different things. So I know that's a little bit abstract, but I hope that that's helpful in terms of at least, you know, stepping back and asking the questions, in what ways do I feel excluded? Has this been happening for a long time? And really trying to narrow it down and pinpoint will also help you think of how you can go about it. Um, is it truly possible to have an inclusive organization? <laughs> well, um, my uh, optimistic side would say yes. Um, I think that it's, it's a practice and I think that it has to come from not just the top, but it has to come from everybody. We can't change others, we can only change ourselves. And the more we educate ourselves, the more we attend workshops and we think about this, the more it does change. Um, I'll give an example of a client that I've been working with for the past 11 months and I've delivered dozens of workshops for them on inclusion, exclusion, on inside or outsider dynamics that they're encountering at work. And so there've been over a thousand people who have attended this. This, um, this workshop at this point. And it's really interesting to talk to the client because um, there are some shifts that are taking place. So sometimes even just bringing it to our attention and the awareness and thinking about it, it's those small things. I, I wouldn't say that change happens overnight, but I think that when you really reinforce that as part of the culture on a macro level, as well as a micro level, then it definitely can help things. So great question. Okay, I still see there's a number of you on. So um, again, we're at the hour just about. So I wanna thank you very much um, 
for, um, for your participation, for your questions, for your sharing today, and wish you best of luck as you go forward.